Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ben Brophy, and we haven't met yet, but now I get to meet all of you. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a lay pastor at Delray Baptist Church up in Northern Virginia, and so I actually know, I've known Kelton, your pastor, for a couple of years now. So I came to Delray as a lowly intern, and Kelton was on staff, and he took pity upon me and was willing to be my friend, even though I was just a lowly intern. And so. We struck up a friendship over theology and the things of God and Star Wars and things of that sort. And so he was uh, really kind to be a friend to me um, a while ago. And so, so when he came here, we kept that friendship going just by text message, talking about whatever latest nerdy theological thing we want to talk about, but also how we're pursuing Christ, his ministry here. And so I haven't met you, but I feel like I've heard lots about you, very encouraged by everything he has to say about all of you. And so it's super uh, fun and exciting and encouraging for me to be here to put some names to faces and kind of just be with you all. Um, it's amazing. God is building his church across the globe. And um, even though we don't know each other, we're going to be praising the Lord together now and forever in eternity. And so that is super encouraging to me. Um, I'm going to give us a little bit of context to the passage we're preaching, and then I'll pray for the Lord to illuminate his word, and then we'll jump into it. So we're in Psalm 131 today. That's Psalm 131. And this is labeled as a song of ascents. I know that little title, Song of Ascents, that is inspired just as much as the rest of scripture is. And the root in Hebrew, the root word in Hebrew for ascent is, is to, it's to go up. And so the idea here is that these Psalms of Ascent, essentially Psalms 120 to 134, are kind of pilgrim songs that the Israelites sang as they went up to Jerusalem to worship and praise God. So there'd often be festivals and feasts and things of this sort. And the Israelites from all over would walk to Jerusalem and they would go up because Jerusalem is on a hill and so they have to go up. And so the, schol the scholarly thinking here is that songs of ascents were pilgrim songs that were sung as Israelites went up to Jerusalem uh, to worship the Lord. So some of the idea here is they're preparing their hearts and their minds to encounter the Lord God. Um, for today, our particular psalm, Psalm 131, it's written by King David, and it's often paired with Psalm 130. Um, some scholars pair 130, 131, 132, uh, but 130 and 131 are always kind of come together. And so we'll reference 130 and in relation to 131 a little bit. Um, so that's kind of the background here. Here's, here's the context um, of our passage today. Um, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for the Lord to illuminate his word. Heavenly Father, we do come to you as people who need you, as created beings, as humans who don't know what you know. We need you to show us your truth. 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that uh, natural people cannot discern spiritual things because we're natural people. We need your spirit to regenerate us in order to see the things of God. And so too it is with your word. We can't understand your word without you opening our eyes to see what you would have us see. And so as we, as we jump into Psalm 131, Lord, help us see your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify us in that truth and help us see what you'd have us see. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 240 billion, 240 billion, that's the number of dollars that was spent on advertising in the United States in 2019. For the sake of comparison, the next, the next closest country that spent anywhere near this kind of money on advertising was China with 84 billion. So the US saw three times the advertising dollars spent in 2019 versus China. This advertising is often designed to create a sense of discontent in us, a sense of my life is not complete until I get this thing or this product or my life changes in this way or that way. So this money, this massive amount of money, money that I can't even comprehend, is aimed at creating in us discontent. It stands to reason that our cultural context is one that is focused on discontent and solving that discontent over and over and over again through material things, material goods, services, things of this sort. Certainly the past two years in the midst of COVID hasn't done anything 
to dissuade this sense of discontentment, there is all sorts of articles that you can read on people leaving their jobs or taking new jobs or rethinking where they live, selling their house, all sorts of things that contribute to this sense of unsettledness, this sense of discontent. And so it stands to reason that we are a people that are biased towards or lean towards discontent. I know for me, this, this discontent often expresses itself like the idea of, well, if I could just get to this spot in my life, then I will have peace. I'll be able to breathe, I'll be able to take a breath. If I just have this much in my savings account, I can relax. If I just get to my vacation, I'll finally be able to take it easy. If I could just get a new boss, I would like my job. If my spouse would change in such and such a way, I'd have a good marriage. If my kids could just be safe or provided for in a specific way, if retirement could be here sooner, if I had health, of a certain type, then I could rest, then I could be content. And the thing is, most of these desires are desires for good things. Health is a good thing, a strong family life is a good thing, a good marriage this is a good thing, a good job is a good thing. But they're not ultimate things. They're not meant to be what bears up our hopes. It's not meant to bear the weight of our expectations because all of these things are impermanent. They cannot last. But our text today points us to someone who does last. It points us to the Lord who is eternal and to his son, Jesus Christ, who offers to take our burdens and in exchange, give us peace and true contentment. So with that, let's read Psalm 131 together. Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. The main idea I want to kind of tease out for us or main action item I want us to take away from this text today is simply this, humble ourselves and hope in Christ. We need to humble ourselves and hope in Christ. Why should we do that? I have three points underneath of that. Three verses, three points. Nice and easy. It's nice when the Bible makes it easy on me. First point, pride and presumption push us towards discontent. Pride and presumption pushes us towards discontent. Second point, contentment comes from Christ. Contentment comes from Christ. And finally, the Lord is our hope. So let's start with that, that first part, that pride and presumption pushing us towards discontent. Talked about the idea of advertising dollars in this country aimed at making us discontent. This, I'm pulling this from verse 1. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. And so David here is painting a picture of contentment, of avoiding pride and presumption. But the other side of that, the flip side of that, is that pride and presumption do push us towards discontentment. When we are not content, when pride and presumption rule us, we are discontented in a way that is unsolvable outside of Jesus Christ. But David, he stays content within his station. He doesn't exalt himself, even though he could. David has done many amazing, marvelous things. We're not quite sure when he wrote Psalm 131. Most assume it's when he was the king. Regardless, David lived a life full of deeds worthy of exaltation. And yet, he knows that that doesn't make him great. It does not put him on equal footing with God. He lives in submission to the Lord, the very object of his prayers. And in this, in this psalm, Dave is avoiding the sin of pride. And he's exhorting us to avoid pride as well. And this is difficult because our hearts typically work in kind of the opposite way. We often seek to lift ourselves up. We don't want to be inconvenienced. We want people to serve our needs and make things easier for us. We don't live typically in a way that's thinking of others more than ourselves. This is why repentance is often so hard. This is why apologizing to people we've sinned against can feel like a struggle because we're naturally predisposed to see things our way and in 
in our, like, in our convenience. So a natural question arises here. Why shouldn't we lift ourselves up? And, and the answer is simply that only the Lord should be lifted up. Isaiah 57, 15 says that God inhabits eternity and his name is holy. Only his name is holy, not ours. So pride is a particularly vile type of rebellion where we seek to kick God off of the throne of the universe and put ourselves on it. It attributes to ourselves glory that properly belongs to God. That glory is due the Lord, not us. And the end result of pride isn't pretty. The Bible is full of warnings against pride. Pride comes before fall. Even even people who don't know, have never been in church on a Sunday, have heard that phrase. Pride comes before a fall. Scripture is replete with warnings about pride. But it's even worse than this. James 4, 6 tells us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so if we give in to a sin of pride, we will find the Lord himself opposing us. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And so that ought to make us hesitate and fight hard to avoid the sin of pride. Conversely, Jesus is humble and he demonstrates that for us. Matthew 11.29 phrases it this way, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, Jesus reigned in heaven with God the Father in perfect majesty and power over the entire universe, reigning and ruling. And yet, he was so humble that he was willing to leave that behind, come down to earth and be born in a dingy barn as a baby. And to subject himself to a broken world and the sins of humanity, the betrayal of friends, and death on a cross. Uh, death that's considered particularly shameful. So the king of all that is, the one who holds all things together by the, word of his, by the power of his word, he's willing to subject himself to a shameful death on a cross because he is gentle and lowly in heart and because he loves us. So in, when we sin, Christ's response is not to turn away in pri- disgust, but rather in humility to robe himself in humanity and come towards us. He's not disgusted by us, but he enters in in order to work salvation and reconciliation between us and God. This is humility in a way that we can't fully comprehend, and yet we have to try and emulate. But David pushes us not just to avoid pride, thinking too much of ourselves, but also to avoid presumption. So presumption, the idea of of basically putting ourselves in, in the place of judgment where God should be. And so a question arises here, for me at least, what are the things that are too great and marvelous for David? I mean, he's a king. What, what couldn't be in the purview of David? And the answer is the things of God. The language in Psalm 131 mirrors the language in places like Psalm 86.10, which says, For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. So we as human beings need to recognize God as God and that we are created beings. There are all sorts of examples of presumption throughout human history, but in David's time, a very common one was the idea of rulers of nations claiming to be a deity, claiming to be God, putting themselves in the position of God and being able to declare what is right and what is wrong. We see this in places like the Pharaoh. Also, Julius Caesar claims to be a deity during the Roman Empire. In our context, we don't see that particular uh, expression of presumption uh, so often. But what we do see, what is a little common in our culture, is declaring what is and is not righteous, what is and is not sinful, based on things that aren't the word of God. We do this as individuals. Even Christians do this. So we'll think things or say things like so-and-so doesn't vote the way that I do or so-and-so doesn't raise their kids the way that I would or they don't make the same job decisions I would. We're tempted to make questions of prudence and wisdom, which are important things. We're tempted to make questions of wisdom and prudence into questions of good and evil. And when we do this, we're presuming. We're putting ourselves in the place of God 
and speaking where Scripture doesn't speak. We can't adopt the role of God in our lives. We don't have that option. So a couple of applications for us in order to fight that, ten, that, ten, that, that inclination to be presumptuous. First, we have to stay humble. We have to stay humble. Psalm 139, 6 tells, tells us that such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. At the end of Job, Job 38, famously, Job asks presumptuous questions of God, and God responds to him and says, Who are you? Where were you when I formed the earth? Surely you know where the boundaries of the earth end and begin, and, and shows Job definitively that he is not God. He's presuming to know the mind of God and that he shouldn't do that because God knows much more. And Job responds in repentance and quieting himself because he recognizes that he is a human, a created being, and God is God. And so for us, we have to embrace our limitations. We have to realize that we are created beings and we just do not have the perspective or the knowledge that God has. And so we have to trust him from his superior vantage point of knowing what he's doing. This is how we avoid the snare of pride and presumption. We have to remember who we are, created beings. We live in an ambitious age. Most people think they can achieve or do or control anything. A pastor I, I respect uh, named Zach Eswine said this, we don't need to repent that we don't know everything. We need to repent for trying to know everything. And this leads us to another point of application that we have to trust God's revelation of himself that comes to us through his word. We have to trust the Bible and what it says about salvation and sin and righteousness. Presumption means thinking that the things of God are our domain and purview, but we have to let that go and turn to Scripture to tell us where God speaks and where he doesn't. Deuteronomy confirms this reality for us in chapter 29, verse 29. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are, being re the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So what are these secret things? It's whatever God doesn't tell us. Things like the future, things like why this thing or that thing happened that we can't understand. There are things that we will never understand on this side of eternity. And we have to avoid idle speculation that can lead us into dangerous places about those things. We have to leave the secret things to the Lord and embrace the law, the word that he has revealed to us. He has given us everything we need to know for salvation and the practice of our faith. We have to remember that we are human and God is God. Christ himself models humility for us. He gives us a model of something for us to pursue as created beings. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says this, Have this mind amongst, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who... Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Christ leaves heaven, he takes on the form of a servant to rescue us. And so we fight our pride through our faith in him, through our relationship with him, and his ex end, he gives us an example to follow. We are helpless in our fight against pride without faith in Christ and without his example given to us. He shows us the way to be humble, to avoid pride and presumption. And in doing so, offers us contentment. Which is our next point, that contentment comes from Christ. Verse 2 in Psalm 131, But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. This is an incredible picture of somebody at peace. If you've been around kids for any amount of time, you know the difference between a weaned child, you could also translate this as a well-fed child, a child who just ate, and a, and a baby who's not. So what does an unweaned child look like who's hungry? As one with young kids, it looks 
very loud. They're going to let you know that they have needs and they need to be taken care of as soon as possible. They're going to scream. That's one. Two, the scripture here talks about a child with its mother. So uh, an infant, a baby who hasn't been fed or mom leaves the room, what happens when mom leaves the room? Or if you hand that child to a stranger, typically what happens is again, that baby is going to let you know that it is not happy that mama has left and you've left me with this strange dude. And they're gonna scream. They're gonna let you know. Scripture here, Psalm 131, gives us uh, an, an opposite image. A, a child who is weaned, who is older, who is well-fed, who is at peace. And if mom leaves, that child knows that mom is gonna come back and is at peace, is quiet, calm, the sense of being able to, everything's okay. My mom's in the next room. She's going to bring food when it's time. It's okay. This is the picture that David gives us of what a soul content, contented in the Lord looks like. We talked about Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 earlier, where Christ offers to take our burden and give us rest. Only he can offer this true contentment, this picture of a pacified child. Only he can offer us hope that lasts because he lasts. He is eternal. And so if you've come here today and you're tired and you're exhausted and you're frustrated and you're sad or, or you're just, you just feel like you can't get a moment of peace to yourself because life moves too quickly and there's too much to do and it's anxious and, and sad... Christ bids you to come to him. Lay those things down at his feet. He can bear the weight. In exchange, he will give you peace. This is one of the, 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 the exchange between the Christian and, and Christ. There's, it's, it's the most lopsided trade in history. On one hand, we trade him our sin and he gives us his righteousness. But also we give him all of our crushing burdens and difficulties and anxieties and he gives us peace. Christ continues to give us far more than we deserve if we'll simply turn to him and ask him to. To turn from our sins and put our trust in him. Christ can deliver us in a way that things of this world never could because they're not eternal. They can't offer salvation. And Christ does deliver us through the power of his Holy Spirit if we'll simply turn to him. And this, this contentment that David's talking about here, part of that comes from knowing that nothing, once you've turned to Christ, once you've repented from your sins, once you believe that he lived a perfect life, died and rose again, once you're united to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. So come what may in this world, hardship or ease, you cannot be separated from Jesus. And this works out practically in the life of the Christian. Paul gives us a glimpse of this in Philippians 4, 10 through 13. He says this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, though now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, this verse is famously referenced by several athletes as they try to do amazing athletic endeavors that most of us could never hope to achieve and saying, look, I can do all this great stuff. And that's kind of, you know, throwing a nod to God, to Christ, that they're able to do those things. But that's not the context here at all. Paul, who was shipwrecked, beaten, abandoned, persecuted by people he considered his own countrymen, his own people, is telling the church in Philippi that I can be content through the midst of difficulty, through when I have nothing, because I have Christ, which can never be taken from me. And once we're united to Christ, we're indwelled with the Holy Spirit. We're not alone in our fight for contentment. Christ has sent the helper, the Holy Spirit, to help us fight for that contentment, to help us depend on Christ more. And so this is how we, we gain that peace of a weaned child with its mother. 
the image I have is just of a, a small child, three or four years old, fed, happy, leaning against mom, at rest. David is telling us to quiet and calm our souls as he has. And he tells us to do that by hoping in the Lord. And this brings us to our final point, which is the Lord is our hope. This is verse 3. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever more. There's a particularly important point of application for placing our hope in the Lord. And it's, it's in the midst of difficulty. It's in the midst of suffering. And so David, our author here, has seen quite a bit of suffering. If you, if you survey his life, um, you see things like Absalom killing his, killing his oldest son, Amnon, who raped his daughter. You see rebellion uh, of Israel from Absalom against him. You see the deaths of friends and civil war and injustice in a way that you know David suffered through. And he lost an infant son. He knows what it is to suffer. And so this is where Psalm 130 helps us unpack Psalm 131. Because Psalm 130 is coming from a place of suffering. Psalm 130 verses 1 and 2 says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. This sure sounds like David pleading for mercy in the midst of suffering. Verses 5 and 6 show us that David is aware that only God has the power to help him in his suffering. And so David yearns for it. It says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. So he knows his only help, help is in the Lord. And so he waits for the Lord. David also tells us that only the Lord can redeem in verses 7 and 8 from 130. O Israel, hope in the Lord. See that? And that's the same language we see in 131. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. See, part of, it, part of David's suffering, part of his pain, came from his own sin. Scripture tells us that David's sin with Bathsheba would lead to Absalom's rebellion. And so in that circumstance where David's biggest enemy is himself, his own sin, and he can't redeem himself from it, he knows only the Lord can redeem him. And so he turns to the Lord to redeem him. And he knows that the Lord has promised to redeem Israel from iniquities. And so he calls on God to fulfill that promise. The call for us is similar in our own suffering. Dave Harvey, a uh, pastor for about 33 years, um, he's been involved in different things, and now he's a pastor, uh, he's a, he works um, on church planning, so he tries to help churches get planted around uh, the United States. He recently lost his youngest daughter. She passed away. And in his, in his suffering, one of the things, he, he asked people who knew him, or people who follow him, he asked them for prayer, a specific prayer. He asked people to pray that him, Dave, would want to suspend judgment on why God took his beloved daughter until the day I can ask him face to face. This is a hard thing. But what he's saying is that he doesn't want to presume he knows why, the why behind the loss of his daughter. And he doesn't want to make assumptions about the why until he can actually talk to the Lord face to face, which is coming someday. You see, Israel's hope was in a future Messiah, and he came in the person of Jesus Christ. Our hope is also in Christ, who came, but is also coming again. This last day that Dave Harvey is talking about is coming. The Lord is our hope because he is coming again. That last, that last half of the verse 3, hope in the Lord from this time, so this time, forth and forevermore, ongoing, through eternity, because that hope will not end. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, gives us a little bit of a picture of what this salvation, this hope, looks like. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our salvation in Christ is imperishable. It can't be destroyed. It can't be ended. It's undefiled, meaning our sin or others' sin can't dirty it, can't impugn it, can't make it less than it is. And it's unfading. It's going to go on forever. Our salvation continues for all of eternity. If we are in Christ, our hope is unfading and forever. Can't be destroyed. We're free from sin. It goes on constantly. Revelation 21, 1 through 4 gives us a picture of what this is like. The idea of in that place, the Lord will dwell with his people and he will be their God. There will be no more death, no more sin, no more tears, no more sickness. All of that will come to an end. That is the hope for the Christian. And so the call to us from David is to hope in the Lord. I've had the privilege of knowing someone who's exemplified this this hope in the Lord, this contentment in the Lord uh, through my whole life. And my grandmother, uh, who, who is a believer and came to Christ at a, at a relatively young age, um, she endured things that I, I can't quite imagine. Um, from an adulterous husband who was also physically abusive and addicted to alcohol, to losing a son who was killed by a drunk driver, to uh, losing other children uh, through a variety of, of illnesses and things of that sort. She endured for decades. She's, she's still with us. Uh, she's 97 at this point and still going strong. And what my sister, um, who just marveled at her willingness to, to be joyful through every circumstance, once sat her down and said, Grandma, I, how, do you, how do you forgive these people? There was one particular instance that happened. She went to the funeral of my grandfather who had treated her so poorly. And so my sister, a couple of days later, just talked to her and was like, how do, how do you extend this kind of grace and forgiveness and hope? I don't, I don't quite get it. And my grandmother, who um, doesn't have a PhD in theology by any means, but understood what true theology drives people to, said simply this to my sister Hillary, that's my sister's name, I do the best that I can and then I just give the rest to God and trust in Christ. That was it. But she lived a life of contentment in the Lord. She recognized that she was limited and was able to endure because her hope was not set on the perfect marriage or the safety of her children. Her hope was set on God. And so for us, in the same way, we have to humble ourselves by remembering who we are and put our hope in Christ. We have to avoid the pride and presumption that drives us towards discontentment. And we have to pledge ourselves, we have to pursue the contentment that only comes from Christ. And there will be a day where all the things that we don't understand will be clear to us. That last day where the Christian will begin uh, eternity with Christ forevermore. And so is this picture of a weaned child at rest with its mother, is that appealing? Is that sense of, of being at rest, at peace, that is that something your soul desires? Because if it is, this is what the Lord offers us through Christ. And the Bible tells us the only way for us to approach the Lord is as a child. Jesus called, a, uh, in Matthew 18, 3, Jesus calls a child to him to sit in his lap and says, you must enter the kingdom of heaven as this child. And so if, if we are going to be one of God's people, if we're going to approach the Lord, we don't have anything that we can bring. There's nothing we can do to force him to recognize us as his child, but rather, like a child, we come with nothing and put our dependence on Christ. We must approach the Lord as a child with nothing to offer. So this, this passage gives us a picture of the, of the rest and contentment that can be found. But the other side of that is the Bible tells us is there is no other option for approaching the Lord. We must come as children. And so let us do that through our hope 
and Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we do pray that you would make us as children who rest in you. Children whose souls are at peace. Children who are dependent on Christ for our righteousness. We pray that you would help us see clearly that our salvation can only be found through Christ. And we know that if we place our faith in him, we have assurance of salvation. We know we will, our, if we put our hope in the Lord, that that hope will be consummated at the end of all things, where we will be your people and you will be our God forevermore. So help us in our fight against pride and presumption. Help us to remember who we are as your beloved children and the reality that we are not God and trust you with the secret things of God and trust your word to give us instruction in matters of salvation and doctrine in how we live. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.